for a fact that I've never seen so much excitement and so much innovation in my entire life. It's going bananas. So, which of these technologies take off? I'm sorry, I'm probably running way out of time. Um, let's talk about AI and machines. Um, we've got AI is now permeating pretty much every business, every technology, and you can see what's going on in the numbers. Here's how much is money is going on, money is going into AI globally. 51 billion dollars invested globally. In Asia, it's uh, 19.8 billion. In uh, in the US, 25.7 billion. Uh, this is uh, for Q4 2018. This is only Q4 2018 globally. And in Europe, little old Europe, we're only doing 5 billion in the, into AI. We have to catch up because this is a global race. And unfortunately, it could, it's almost borderline a global war at this point. And if you look at venture capital investment into AI, you've got up to 2017, it went up to 5 billion alone. And that's tracking, I think, only US. Um, only, uh, well, 2018 through uh, 17. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, I can't see. Anyway, it's a lot of money. Um, <laughs> so, uh, what's going on is actually these AI technologies have matured to quite a large extent. 37% of organizations now deploying, uh, according to Gartner. Uh, that's chatbots, computer assisted diagnostics, fraud protection, consumer fragmentation, you name it. It's going into everything um, robotics, vehicles, drones, appliances, agents. So the enormous amount of data that you can see the in tech is now being applied with algorithms. So no industry is left affected. All of these industries are affected, and the list goes on. And what happens when you apply AI to a business is you get what I call the AI lock-in loop. And what's the AI lock-in loop? You get, you apply AI to a business, which makes a better product because the product is so much better because you've applied AI, which leads to more data because now the data is better. <laughs> That improves the AI, you use that data, better data to improve the AI, and therefore you make more profit, which is then pumped into the AI to make a better AI, and make a better product yet again, and you go back to square one again. So you get this virtuous circle, this loop going on, and if you apply that, exponential, if you apply that to a business, your business becomes an exponential business. You're no longer on a straight line going up, you are now on an exponential curve. And if you do that and your competitor doesn't, you win. Extended reality. <coughs> Extended reality is the new phrase to cover what we used to call AR, <coughs> VR, and uh, mixed realities. This is now taking off as well. This means that You've got new extended reality technologies to shape consu how consumers and workers interact with the world. You've got virtual person personal assistants who can detect our emotions, you name it. So it's, it's not just goggles, it's, it covers everything that augments your reality. And that can be many different things. Blockchain, the extremely hyped technology of the last few years. Really quite transformative, a kind of an, a, a new internet, an, a, an internet layer over the internet. Um, trustless, trustless, I always get conf confused by that word. What it actually means is there is no central authority to trust. It, it is trustworthy in its own right because it's because of the mathematics involved. Decentralized, you don't need a central location, you don't need a bank in the middle, all the transactions between entities 
for instance, are completely trusted, <coughs> decentralized. It's traceable, so you can see what happens on the blockchain, and it's transparent. You can see everything that happens on a blockchain. And it's being applied to property in terms of, um, now, for instance, I could um, own parts of a house in Manhattan, never visit the house. Um, I could own, oh, I could make sure that uh, an artwork I have, the, the Monet sitting in my house, oops, did I just give it away, um, is verifiably by Monet. Um, in finance and in healthcare, uh, this blockchain is making transformative effects. But the point about this isn't that blockchain is amazing in its own right, because of course it is, but the point is, is that it's, it's part of this other bigger, bigger thing that's going on. It's not in a silo. So you, you, if you, you really, really take off when you start to merge some of these things. If you merge AI, blockchain, and IoT, so that you can tell if something happened in the real world as much as happening on your computer screen. If you could tell that uh, the uh, uh, that a farm has deployed uh, its seeding, if you can as well, and it happened, you can tell that it happened uh, because of blockchain, because if the IoT linked to blockchain, and the seeding has happened because a robotic tractor has gone right. We need to plow the fields now. Okay, that's already going. Um, and you can also talk about AI and quantum as well. So let's talk about quantum. What the heck is that, Mike? Big words, Mr. Butcher. Um, what we've got here now, quantum computing, an exponentially different type of computing. Um, move, it's moving basically gradually from the theory to reality after about 50 years of, of a lot of theory. Uh, Quantum computers are able to theoretically work on millions of computations <coughs> at once. Well, not just millions, but billions, of course, trillions. And in a commercial state, could radically transform such industries as healthcare, finance, cybersecurity. It could mean potentially that all forms of cybersecurity become unsafe once again. And but there are real-world applications in terms of medicine and pattern recognition, say, for healthcare. But what's interesting is not just quantum computing, which is gradually becoming a reality, but what happens if you mix all of these things? You get this thing called dark. So dark is distributed ledger. Stop. Um, distributed ledger technology, uh, or blockchain. Um, artificial intelligence. The R stands for reality, could be virtual reality, augmented reality, assisted reality, extended reality. And then finally, quantum computing. And at the, at the start of it, at the heart of it, businesses apply all of these technologies. Well, I mean, we're talking Star Trek, ladies and gentlemen. But it's very interesting, if you, if it, as a business, instead of you going, who's got the blockchain project, or who's got the AI project, or who's got the extended reality project. If you start looking at all of these technologies in unison, then you start to see, see this, how the patterns start to come together. Now, one of the big issues for the next couple of years is going to be privacy, and not trust, I don't think, but distrust. Privacy and distrust. So there's this tension, isn't there, between privacy and commercial utility. It's kind of like, how much privacy do I want to give away, and how much value do I get back? Not just as a consumer, but as a business as well. What, it, what are consumers willing to do in order to get more personalization? We kind of want to live in a personalized world, don't we? Because we are egotistical. I mean, not me, I mean, maybe other people, but um, we are ego. It's all about the id, the ego. And we love it when things are totally personalized to us. 
But there's a trade-off, isn't there? What is that trade-off? You know, it might be fun to share what, you know, all my deep, dark secrets and my, my uh, trouser length or whatever, my heartbeat with Facebook. But what's the trade-off with that? And how are governments going to act and regulate? Because governments are lurching towards huge amounts of regulation now because they are now becoming aware of, of this capability. But I'm going to leave you with some optimistic things. There will be flying cars. <laughs> Super exciting, huh? <coughs> We're really excited about this. Who's, uh, I don't know if this is, does this work? If I just go like that? Um, we've got the Lilium Jet. Now this uses a very cool technology called distributed electric propulsion, which was invented some time ago by NASA. But what you can do is you can make an aerofoil lift a body straight up in the air, VTOL, and fly through the air. This is a, a prototype, but eventually it will go 300 miles per hour for 300 miles, or I think it's kilometers, sorry, and um, act as an autonomous taxi. So you get in, press the map where you want to go, and it takes you there. So, quite exciting. And technologies like this, not just distributed electric propulsion, but more traditional big quadcopters like you've seen, will um, start to appear in Dubai. We don't have to watch all of that. <laughs> it is German, correct. Munich, I believe. Um, and um, it also, what's going on with this? Who, who's got AirPods? It, 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 is it AirPods? Yeah, AirPods. Um, it's, um, we've all got, we all know we Johnny Ive. In a wireless future. We live in a wireless future. The future. The future. All of your devices so exciting. intuitively connect. <laughs> the future's bright. Now, we know what these things are. They go into our ears and we walk along. We look like we've got something, some earwax, a very large earwax. But um, it's not just about that. Because if you, the Andreessen Horowitz, one of the biggest VCs in the world, talk about how it is the first of its kind voice to is the new interface of the future. We all know that in the way that Alexa has taken off. But I want you to remember, Think what would happen if you put a camera on your AirPod, AirPod and you turned it that way. In China, this is what's had going on with this poor chap. So he's, tr he's trying to cross, cross the road. What am I going to do? How do I cross the road? Uh -oh. Wouldn't it be good if I had an interface in the world that told you what was going on? So frustrating, as you can tell. When it's set here. The future's bright. If I can see what's going on with my, my camera, what happens if I put the camera in my ear? Because then it can talk to me. Now, that looks crazy, doesn't it? Tell you across the road. But there's nothing wrong with that. You can do that probably next week with your AirPods. Thanks very much. Yeah, we have a couple of uh, couple of minutes, so I'd like to okay. follow up with a, with a few questions on this dystopian uh, wireless future thing. So. One question that springs to mind, you mentioned the AI lock-in loop. It seems that applies to many businesses. So you become great at things and you get all these new technological layers that you can apply to your business that will reinforce your position in the market. And, and many of the great companies now, they read the playbook. They understand what happened to IBM or to Yahoo, which made them not profitable or unprofitable, but just well, and you have to strive for it. It's not just going to come to you. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, 
so talking a little bit about Norway. Um, so, uh, as you mentioned, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm involved with the, uh, the World Economic Forum, and uh, one of the, the key things is that I know every year they do a lot of different global reports. And uh, this is one of the, it's called the Network Readiness, which is part of the Digital Readiness Index uh, that we did a few years back. And you can see that Norway is number four. I mean, it's, it's, it, for those of us in the back, you can't see, the number one is Singapore, then it's Finland, Sweden, Norway. So there's a disproportional, uh, I would say, Scandinavian representation in the top five. So Norway is right out there. That means the infrastructure and essentially the technology um, is there and is one of the top in the world. Here's an interesting thing. Now if you start looking at the global startup ranking for countries, um, clearly in the top you, you have some uh, uh, kind of expected players, the US, um, UK. But here's where Norway is. Norway is just after Malaysia, and number 44 on this index. So then you're, you're looking at a pretty interesting and disproportional uh, uh, statistic. You know, on one hand, Norway is right up there, and it's everything, by definition, by infrastructural definition, Norway should be one of the top 10, at least. However, something is not adding up, um, and clearly when it comes to the startup index, uh, Norway is actually quite behind a lot of other countries. And let's take a look at the, the city of Oslo, uh, because they also have a city-based ranking. Number 81 on the list, just above Santa Barbara. That was in California, for those that you don't know. It's about actually two hours from uh, my hometown. <laughs> um, so, and it's it definitely above Brussels, it's above Frankfurt, it's above Riga, above Rome and above Oakland, uh, San Francisco, uh, the United States, which is also just 10 minutes away from San Francisco. So, pretty interesting statistics if you think about you know, what should happen versus what is happening. Um, I think there's still a lot of uh, work to be done, and certainly it says that a lot about the ecosystem is still maturing, and it very much needs the whole community, and the community might be in this room to actually make this happen. Um, because I, I would very much, uh, now that I live here, I would very much, of course, like to see Oslo and, and specifically Norway being part of the top 10 um, instead of being number 44, just above Malaysia. So why is that? Um, so I'd like to give a few perspectives on why I think this might be the case. And uh, of course, something I'm not going to talk about is uh, in every country, there's a different timeline to uh, tech community development. You know, some countries started earlier, uh, some markets started earlier, so of course they're naturally more developed. And uh, so I think Oslo, and specifically Norway, um, I think it has been slightly behind other Nordic countries when it comes to this new economy, um, for reasons I'm sure everyone in this room um, you already know, uh, it's because Historically, there's been very, very strong and dominant uh, national economies. And pointing out some obvious is, of course, the oil economy and uh, the marine uh, economy, such as shipping. Um, so today, I'm just going to talk about some of the main challenges uh, for not just the Norwegian ecosystem, but specifically for Norwegian startups. And what are the challenges that I see now I'm on this side of the equation? And uh, some people, my, some of my friends think I'm, I'm a bit sadistic on going back to even smaller companies um, at, after having been a part of larger companies. But I think, again, going back to this belt, the karate belt perspective, um, I have only invested in small companies before. Uh, some of them have grown to, to $400 million companies, but um, mm -hmm. I very much want to have this hands-on experience myself to say, I've invested in those companies, but now I like to take the learnings I have and actually grow one and build one myself. So the five things I'm going to talk about today are market, investor, culture, risk, and talent. So it's not a surprise that uh, I actually do think population size, it, it does matter in the global uh, scheme of things. Now, I think one could argue and say, well, Sweden has only got a, you know, 
shy of 10 million people, but Sweden has outpunched its weight class into the world's number two unicorn factory in the world. Um, so I think that is a very unusual case. Um, so I'm not here to talk about Sweden, uh, I'm here to talk about Norway, but I think I, it's important to point out that uh, while population size matters, you do have exceptional cases, so it can be done. Um, I think in the case of, uh, uh, of Norway, and if you ask most of the institutional investors here in tech, they would say that Norway is really more geared up for B2B tech companies as opposed to B2C. Um, if you are a B2C company, if you're, uh, if you're born in a large population like the US, for example, all you really need is 10% of the population to use your B2C product. And guess what? You have 30 million people. And that is bigger than the entire Scandinavia combined, right? So, uh, so B2C, it does require very large market. And yes, it's true that companies today, you can born out of a small country and then you can actually grow into a global market. But I think when it comes from an investor perspective, very much on the traction and the user usage, you do need to have a very mature and a, a sizable uh, addressable market for the B2C products to be used. So uh, in that case, it's not a surprise that majority of the companies um, that are going internationally, you know, coming out of Norway, tend to be more B2B as opposed to B2C. So I think that's a natural limitation because that has nothing to do with anyone here, has nothing to do with your capability. It's just a matter of fact. Um, the market embraces more B2C companies in Norway as opposed to B2C because it's much harder to scale the population, uh, the user population. Now let's talk about a little bit the, uh, about the investors uh, in this market. And I, didn't, I specifically didn't say tech investor um, because I think it's investor in general. And you know, throughout my, my career, I've had the uh, fortunate uh, opportunities to deal with different types of investors from hedge funds to PE funds to venture funds to large angel investors to small angel investors. And I think uh, my comment here is that what I have noticed here is that majority of the investors of any asset class, um, I think majority of them in Norway tend to shy away from tech. Um, and again, besides the oil effect, besides the, uh, the shipping and the large industries effect, there's also, as I come to learn, there is also property, which apparently just you know, brings cash. And, uh, in Norway, it's, it's kind of like, do you want to sink five million nook into a tech company, or do you want to go buy an apartment? I think majority of the investors with liquidity in this market will probably go with the property, as, which is the reason why Norwegian property prices are disproportionately uh, expensive compared to other parts of the world. I mean, you're paying London, Notting Hill, Mayfair prices in, in, in Oslo, where the population is one tenth, you know, if not more. So it's, to me, it's bizarre, but I understand why. Uh, because property is safe. Property, you, you, you both get short term yield, you know, on the income side, and you get long term gain. So um, I, I understand why a lot of investors basically say, well, if I have some liquidity, I just put it in property and let it sit there. Because it's not, chances are, it's not going to crash. But tech companies are much more volatile. Um, you know, some of them fly, some of them don't. And I would say, generally, you know, talking about being an investor, if you haven't lost money, then you probably haven't invested, because all the investors that you know, mature investors, everybody's lost money, because it's kind of part of the game. Uh, if you don't lose money, you won't learn, because you won't know what's good if you don't know what's bad. By the way, I'm not being sadistic, suggesting you should lose money. I'm saying that, you know, this is just a matter of fact. Um, so that, I, I think in Norway, there is an investor complacency because, um, especially also for Norwegian venture funds, um, which there aren't too many compared to other markets, a lot of times I think investors here don't have to work very hard because there's enough companies that will actually just come to you uh, because there are so many companies that need financing. Um, whereas in other markets, and again, I hate to point out, like in Stockholm or, or Copenhagen, where 
there are a lot of investors, and there are even more amount of uh, uh, startups, which means that there's a, it's a competitive market. So as an investor, if you move slow, if you don't know what you're talking about, if you don't have, uh, if you don't work hard to get a deal, it's very easy that it's very easily that the deal would just slip away because someone else moved faster. So in, in other markets, you see that investors are working hard towards getting a deal, where I think in, in Norway, the investors don't have to work very hard because deals just come to them because there's not too many funds around. And the biggest fund, venture fund in Norway, is basically 500 million NUC. That is roughly 50 million pounds. In, in the UK, since we're on the a, a, a pound, that will make you a small fund. Mm -hmm. Right, so you are, you know, the biggest fund in, in venture fund in Norway is a small fund size in other countries. So it's a disproportional, again, relationship with the tech market. Um, the third one I want to talk about is uh, there is a cultural uh, barrier, um, but I do think culture is changing. And, uh, and again, I say this from both an academic perspective and also an operational perspective because people are changing into a more global mindset. Um, but I always like to, to use one specific case, um, and I will use this anonymously because I, I don't think it's fair to, to the person, but I, I, I describe this case as a, a typical case of what I'm talking about when it comes to cultural barriers. When, when we first raised the uh, 100, so we, for, for Tidal or Spiro, we raised 100 million Swedish kroner uh, from, the, from the stock market to launch this global service called Tidal. And we had about three months between, you know, we received the money, which was in May 2014, to launching the service into a global service. Um, and I would say at that time, it's at least 10 countries. And, uh, we had about three months to do that. So there's a lot of work. Now, if you follow the timeline, we got the money in May, which means that we're ready to deploy in June and to actually do the work. And June is the month before July, which is holiday. And uh, so, of course, holiday is very sacred in, in Scandinavia in general. But as I found out, it's even more sacred here. And uh, so there's, the, the, the cabin lifestyle is uh, something I'm, I'm still trying to get into, uh, but I can't say it's, uh, it's natural to my DNA. Um, but I think uh, the, the example is this. So we got the money, and uh, so it's basically all hands on deck at that point because we have three months over summer to get this done, to launch Tidal. And at that point, we didn't have a name called Tidal. We just had a service. And uh, so I asked pretty much everybody in the company. At that, at that time, we had about 100, just over 100 staff. Uh, 75 were in Oslo. And uh, so I asked everybody to say, you know, I'm really sorry, but the opportunity here, let me be a part of the future. And let me take some chances on my side to work at this company by taking a little bit of a, a discount on my, on my normal salary, but in exchange, I'm gonna take something in the future uh, in terms of you know share whether it's shares or options or, or any upside. So I think this is um, it's a very important thing because if you don't have a high tolerance for risk, tech is probably not the place you should be because it is volatile. You know, again, the typical conventional wisdom on, on the venture side is nine out of ten companies will probably not go well. So there's a very good chance, this 90% chance that you will be working for a company that may not make it in the next two to three years. But that's just part of the game. So if you don't want to be in the game, then don't try to play the game. Um, then in that case, it would affect the overall ecosystem and also on a national level in terms of can Norway become a competitive tech market to other Scandinavian capitals? That's not a question I, I can answer. It's a question for, for you guys. And then is the last point, um, which is related to talent retention. Um, or to talent attraction, I'm sorry. See, but I just want to check how much time do I have? Okay. okay. Um, so two years ago, I did a, uh, an advisory for the Norwegian Ministry of Trade 
through Innovation Norway, which is actually putting together a program on how to get talents, meaning people, um, into Norway. Um, because fundamentally, no Innovation Norway at that time and the Ministry of Trade, they, their question when they uh, when they asked me was, how do we how do we attract investors to come here to Norway? And I said, you're asking the wrong question, because. It, it, in, in the game of tech, it's not about how to get investors to come in. Why? Because it's a, I use the analogy, which is uh, famously coined by, by another, a very famous in, investor in, in London, Saul Klein. Um, but you know, it's, it's similar to finding uh, good waves. If you if you're looking for good waves um, and the best waves in the world, how do you find it? You don't find it scientifically. You don't use a sonar system. You don't you know you don't read a book. You follow the surfers. You get the, the analogy, right? Surfers are the talents, people that know how to build, people that love to build. So you don't develop a program to get investors to come to Norway. If you get the talents here, the investors will follow because they will, they will follow the surfers. The surfers know how to ride the big waves, and the big waves could be an industry or a trend or something else. But the point is, is that get the right uh, and experienced surfer to find the waves, and that you will have your waves. So the program that I ended up developing was actually nothing to do with investors because it's not about getting investors. Investors, they want deals. They know how to sniff out the good entrepreneurs and the good company builders. If you get those people here, you will have the investors. Um, Sorry, uh, I thought that was interesting. Um, speaking also, this is uh, it's not that new, but it's relatively new. Apparently, Sweden allows every employee to take six months off to start their own business. I thought that was extraordinary. Um, that basically removes a huge amount of risk for everybody. If if you can't get things to work in six months, then go back to your last job. And I think that this is a good example of mixing socialism in terms of the security and the stability that you can provide for, for the citizens, but also including a little bit of innovation to say, take your six months worth of risk. Because if it doesn't work out, if you find out that it's not for you, and entrepreneurship is not for everybody. Uh, it's, it's a very, very difficult um, industry to be in. And if you're not ready for it, you probably shouldn't do it. But you should always give it a go and see if it's for you. Um, I'm moving on to, to, to the last part, and I think the biggest challenge uh, for, for the Norwegian startup ecosystem here is about differentiation. Uh, like I mentioned before, you know, this market is competing against other Nordic markets, and the question is, if you think about it from the talent attraction perspective, if you are a talented, let's say, Scandinavian or Nordic founder, why would you come to Oslo? And, you know, there are some reasons for why you would go to Stockholm. There are some reasons for why you would go to Finland, because uh, Finland is very specializing, for example, gaming. Um, why would you go to Copenhagen? And then, why do you come to Oslo? What is it about Oslo that is special and unique um, that actually would attract foreign talent and more diversity into this market? Because you need this network to actually make a, a, a market, a domestic market, global. And unfortunately, I, I can't answer that again. That's for everybody else here to, to answer. Um, but what I can say is that uh, the key ingredients to, to a startup ecosystem, um, this is actually by, by Oracle, uh, not, for, not by me. But you know, there, there are these kind of uh, ingredients that you can put in. And we can study them. We can know and say, take the box here. But at the end of the day, um, it has more to do with the mentality change of the market. And I think it's very important to, to remember that tech or not tech, at the end of the day, um, it is about celebrating human potential in an era of technology because people need to imagine. You need to be able to imagine these things and you need to be excited about creating. And uh, so I think this is a very important part to remember. And strangely enough, I did not coordinate this with Mike, but I'm also going to end with, a, an, um, oh, actually, no, he's with George. Uh, Orwell. <laughs> this is uh, Aldous Huxley. Um, the secret of genius is to actually 
uh, carry the spirit of the child into an older age, which means never losing your enthusiasm. And I think that is a very important part, because at the end of the day, the tech economy, the, the tech community, is very much about having that enthusiasm to create, to, to, to go into the unknown. Um, and yes, it carries some risk, but no risk, no reward. Or as in the States, we, we say, without struggle, there will be no progress. If you don't struggle, then you will not progress as quickly. So, thank you very much. Depends on what's going, what, what's in the truck. One of the theories about uh, autonomous truck driving is that you don't, at the moment, with a human driven truck, you've got to have a very large truck because you've got one human and they've got to go far down the road to pick up the lumber or the whatever it is, um, and, or the coal or something. And uh, with autonomous car, autonomous, autonomous trucks, you just, they drive themselves and you just send them in a kind of just-in-time mechanism. They don't need to be that large. They don't even need to go fast down the road. You just send them off like little, you know, little firing out of a gun. Um, and, and also they can flock, so you can set some of them off on, you know, in a big bunch or one at a time. It doesn't matter. So it's a different sort of a di different economy. But with the, but we are effectively training algorithms to replace ourselves. And then what happens then? Does it? become the case that uh, the job gets replaced or that your, the nature of your, your, what you do changes so that you're kind of managing the algorithms or you are, you're doing higher work which the algorithms can't do yet, by the way. So um, that's an issue. Um, certainly I think there are kind of large, large businesses out there, uh, very large like the KPMGs, etc, etc, etc which are actually, somebody's in those departments is going to go, you know what, I'm going to take the five best, best people on my team, we're going to go and build an algorithm to do the work of the, other, the rest of the department, and we're going to go and set up a really t fast moving startup that can eat the lunch of this big accountancy firm or whatever it is. And that might happen quite a lot as well. But um, so my, now, we're now that we're wanting to go on too long, that's the, that's the question, that's the point. You are training things to replace you. So if our jobs are being replaced and our companies are being replaced, what is it to work? I want to hear from some, one of the women. I don't know. What is it to work in the future? I think uh, um, uh, that's... I agree with you, of course, uh, um, that uh, nowadays uh, old jobs have been replaced by new jobs. And uh, whether you are uh, you work in HR or you work in sales, everything is technology and data driven. So, of course, uh, as a recruiter, because I one of my job is to bring talents to Norway, uh, which is not an easy job to do, I personally focus both on uh, um, uh, technical skills but also soft skills so I really want to take someone on board who is able to uh, for example adapt to change uh, who is uh, curious enough who is eager to learn all the time because we need we have new tools every day uh, in, uh, at work so we need to really be able to learn everyday new tools and be curious and be innovative, move faster, because this is what the market is asking for. Ingeborg, you work with um, AI, right? Um, so what kind of competence, what skills do we need, people sitting here in the future, when your company is big, it's one of the unicorns or changing our workplace? What so, do we need to know? Um, to hopefully before AI takes all of our jobs, um, we, um, we see that uh, what we need is, um, I'm sorry, I think my, my brain just stopped. Could you repeat your question? So you work with AI, and when AI replaces us, what skills do I need or do we need? as workers? Do, are we needed? And what do we need to know? Or what can AI not do that we can do? Right. 
So I clearly should have had AI right now because my brain stopped, so that would have been great. Um, but what we see, or what we hope, is that AI will help augment um, human intelligence so that uh, we actually create much more opportunities than what we uh, take away. Um, and what we're looking for are people with interdisciplinary backgrounds, people who have the ability to uh, see potential across different uh, sectors and, and be agile in that sense. Um, so I think sort of having not only, for example, a digital background, but uh, collab or uh, also including um, experience from different sectors and bringing those qualities together um, is, is something that will help us uh, utilize AI and the potential fully. And Andy, I liked your perspective being in the US, learning Scandinavian cultures. I did a funny move back in those days. Mm -hmm. I went from Norway to the US and studied Scandinavian culture from the American perspective. Oh, yeah. Very interesting, oh. very interesting. <laughs> and I think it put me into the, um, the idea of doing my master's thesis on entrepreneurship uh. in Norway. What, is there anything to do to increase entrepreneurship here? And it's very fun to sit now, 20 years later, and seeing that there's hap something has happened. I mean, this big crowd is growing every year for those of Innovation Week. The number of startups is growing, even though we're still back on the list. Yeah. Um, but I'm thinking, is working in a startup or starting up something, is that one of the big changes that we see increasing more in the future? I think career choices, it's always going to be an issue uh, or a, a question that people go through. So I, I don't think that's going to stop, or I don't think that's new either. I think what is maybe different is that the younger generation, let's call it a younger generation from anything from Gen X, which is actually they're now getting old, uh, but more, let's say, generically speaking, uh, millennials. So if you're like 17 to 34, um, I think one of the biggest changes I've noticed is that the sense of purpose is much, much stronger. And that's the reason why we see a lot of, kind of investment firms focusing on impact, social impact, right? Because it's about, this great, I can do this and build this product, make some money if, you're, if you do it right, but, uh, but w what's the grander purpose? Like, what am I doing here? What am I contributing to society? And what is it, how is it adding value and, and meaning to myself? So I think the, the question, the self-introspective uh, um, process of understanding what is my meaning and what can be my meaning is now redefining what workspace should be like. Co-working spaces, you know, it's not surprising, you know, when, when you have co-working spaces, you meet a lot more people, you're interacting with a lot of different companies. So it's not like the old days where you go to work and you sit in the same place seeing the same 20 faces all day, all year, you know, you have a lot of opportunities to interact with other companies. Mm -hmm. So I think that's, uh, maybe it's, it's definitely the philosophical um, change on what's important. I'm just thinking, is, is working in the future to create a job rather than to get a job? Uh, I think there's a job in both. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so there's still jobs to get. Sure. I mean, I think business is to be made in every angle. You're going to have businesses built on finding people jobs, and you're going to have you know businesses being built to do other things related to that. So I think it's you, you have to have uh, all the equations. Mm -hmm. But Carla, you work in HR, and you say it's hard. You try to bring talent into Norway, and it's hard to find the right talent. And so, what happens with all the people that you don't want? What do we do? What, what is work for the people that Kahoot doesn't want or your AI company doesn't want? So people with no tech skills, for example. Yes. Is it, is it uh, possible to, to see uh, future work for people with no tech skills? I think uh, uh, that for these people, of course, there are opportunities. <laughs> and my uh, advice for them would be to learn. So invest time in learning. So we should be like a long life learner. <laughs> I think at every time in our life, 
because again, uh, uh, technology is changing so fast, and uh, uh, you're not obsolete. You just need to keep up your skills. So learn and uh, learn new tools every day. That would be my advice. Mm -hmm. Because you need to be attractive to the market. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we as an uh, employer, of course, you need to adjust also the way uh, we see new jobs in the future. So as you were saying, uh, uh, Mike, that uh, people are looking for uh, meaningful jobs now, especially new generation, of course. So we as employer really need to create meaningful jobs for these people and be flexible, be more, uh, create more a collaborative environment at work. So, and um, yeah, I'd say learning mm -hmm. is key. I think, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, please. No, no, you go ahead. <laughs> okay, uh, <laughs> I'll go first. <laughs> Uh, I, I think besides the, uh, the the learning part, I think there is a very important part of the social responsibility is to help people identify <coughs> and realize their own potential. Because I think there are a lot of people, they never had the exposure, um, never had the, the training, um, you know, whether it's financial or social, other social economic reasons, they were never exposed to opportunities. So they are consistently trapped in you know, certain economic category. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I think in the future, as the as the world becomes much more knowledge based, it's very important for people in the knowledge, you know, category to actually create opportunities to help this a less privileged or less uh, educated uh, population to do that. And one of the companies that I'm actually trying to bring to Scandinavia, it's a, it's been a American uh, uh, sensation in a way, um, and disclaimer is that I'm an investor of that company. They use AI, interestingly enough, they use AI to identify people's potential to be a developer. So what they do is they would go to the most um, impoverished or, or poor uh, American city, uh, American cities, and actually solicit uh, people, you know, Let's say every, everyday uh, workers, people who one of the sensation, uh, one of the uh, sensational stories is that they would actually train a McDonald's worker who has actually exhibited ability, analytical thinking, just never, you know, that person was never able to um, to be exposed to other opportunities, and through this AI algorithm on, on testing, they they essentially identify this person with much higher potential than what he's doing. Mm -hmm. So therefore, once this person has been identified, they actually train this person, so overlay the education part, and then this person is now making more than five times uh, the hourly income that he was making at McDonald's, um, and he's now becoming an, a, you know, an educated uh, and skilled laborer. Mm -hmm. And I think those stories are much more relevant today uh, than ever, because it is true, because technology or you know, knowledge in, in many ways is displacing many parts of the society. Mm -hmm. And if you don't help that, let's say, the bottom quadrant of the society, I think it's actually, it, it will have a much more negative impact on human civilization. Mm -hmm. uh, I, really, I want to sort of back, back up what Andy s says, and also what Carla says, um, just quickly, I mean, if we don't do that, then what's going to happen is you think things are bad now with Brexit and Trump. You haven't seen, you ain't seen nothing yet when AI starts taking people's jobs, right? Have you heard of pitchforks, right? Have you heard of flaming torches? We ain't seen nothing yet, and this is just the beginning. So we've got to do what Andy uh, uh, actually outlined there. We've got to reach down, we've got to train people. Um, also, if you're doing this, if you're doing a startup, by the way, these days, and you're and you're not in the sort of a, a socially impactful way, if you like, for instance, there's a company in, in, Los a in San Francisco called Impossible Labs that's trying to do Impossible Meat or Impossible Labs, I think, who's trying to do lab-grown meat. And why are they doing that? Not to make a hamburger that tastes like cardboard, but uh, or make a hamburger that tastes like a hamburger so that we don't have to use cows, so the cows don't fart into the atmosphere and create methane and affect global uh, the, clim the climate. 
So, um, and, and also apart from all the, the environmental disaster that industrial farming is. And so that's, an, that's a great thing. But not everybody can work for that company. So if you're not working for a company that has social impact, then do something on the side which does. And that means that you will retain your staff. Because the Gen Z, millennial generation, uh, apparently my generation doesn't care about the planet enough, apparently. I don't know why that is. But some of us did. And, uh, <laughs> um, but you will get, they're more likely to stay with you. Um, we, I work with a non-profit called Techfugees, which has been very warmly received in, in Norway, actually. We did our first hackathon here to get refugees working with the tech community, creating skills, creating jobs, and also creating, guess what, social integration. Fantastic. Now, if we can do that with refugees, we can do that with anybody, right? And so, and I also work with a non-profit in the UK called Tech Vets, which is about military veterans coming out of the armed forces, they've been firing, you know, artillery and tanks and flying aircraft, well, maybe not flying aircraft, but certainly they've been doing, you know, army jobs or, or whatever. And now they're going like, well, what am I going to do? Uh, the biggest job for military veterans is truck driving. This is a mistake. They should not be getting into truck driving. There's no career in this. And we put sit them down and we teach them cyber security skills. And it turns out, a fairly average person, um, even from a military background, and by the way, military background, excellent training for learning. This is the key, you know, you, life, you are a lifelong learner when you're in the military, because one minute your, your captain says, do this, next minute he's doing, telling you to do something completely different. So you have to be a fast learner. And we sit these people down and we t teach them how to do, be cyber security analysts, and six months later, they're qualified. So this is incredibly important, and if they can do that, Hell, hell, what else can they do? So it's really important, I think, that the tech community uh, reaches down and starts doing this. And also, the tech community needs talent. Tons and tons of talent. There are millions and millions of jobs in tech going around now, completely unfulfilled, that we've got to fill in the next decade. And uh, it, we can't just sit here going, let's ed educate people in our own country more, because it, there are, there's enormous growth in the industry. So uh, you can't be complacent, is what I guess I'm trying to say. There's obviously um, a very uh, scarce market for programmers, for tech specialists. I know that from my own company, you know it from Kahoot. That's why we try to bring talented people into this country. Um, but how can corporates, or how can your companies, small companies and big companies, um, um, help Build the competence we need, because if there's less people than we need, than we have, look, there's a lot of work in tech that we don't have the people, and then we have all bunches of people that are uh, not needed anymore. We need more than the educational systems to help people learn. What are Kahoot, for example? Are you doing something to to teach people that don't have the skills to get the skills, or are you only um, focusing on getting people from outside? We actually do both. <clears throat> so we, uh, we do, we have uh, internship programs, for example, with universities, not only in Norway, but also other uh, uh, Nordic countries, but for example, with the uh, university in the UK, in, uh, in the US. Uh, uh, we work a lot with uh, uh, organizations, so for example, that help uh, Norwegian students uh, that study abroad mm -hmm. to come back and work in Norway because we need talents here. So we do uh, again uh, work with both uh, young talents. So we approach them again uh, uh, when they are in bachelor or master uh, studies, and uh, uh, we do a lot in attracting talents to Norway. Mm -hmm. Um, and we at Kahoot, uh, I'm, I have to say, we I'm privileged because we have, a, I think, a, a, a strong brand, and we do something meaningful to make learning awesome. So um, we are fortunate again to to have the talents that come to us. But it's super important when they come from abroad to help them to settle in in Norway. So and especially when if they come with families. It's super important to help not only the employee, but also the family to settle in. So the, uh, 
partner, for example, to find a job, to find schools, kindergarten. So we support them in relocation, but also in uh, I don't know, adapted to Norwegian culture and settling in. So we are running out of time. So I want to have a last personal tips from everyone. We can start with the end here on, because it's obvious that our jobs will change. It changes already, right? Some of you have probably been through a few different uh, careers already. Um, and it will change faster. So what is your best personal tips to everyone here and how to prepare for it? Uh, my tip is actually not to prepare for it. Uh, I think it's if you want to take a chance, you should just do it. You should just do it. So go with the flow? So No, not the flow, because I think the flow is, in a way, it's kind of what the wider um, tre uh, let's say that the macro markets is shaping, which is definitely there's an emphasis on tech. But I would say, as an individual, you can't prepare yourself to go into tech. Either you want to try it out and do it, and just I, I say just do it. Um, take some risk and uh, maybe try it out. And I, I think Norway, in, or similar to other uh, Scandinavian markets, is probably one of the best places to take chances because not much is gonna, you can't do that much damage. Uh, <laughs> you know, because the social welfare system is very, very well covering um, people. And I think that is, that's why I think it's, it should be, that's why I like Norway to be higher up on the list because there's no reason why it shouldn't be. I mean, every ingredient that's required to take risk is here. So why aren't people taking more risks? That's, a, that's my question. So take more risk, dare to take risk. Yes. yes. Carla, your tips for me. Um, again, I think learning for me is key. Uh, so keep up with uh, no, learning new things every day yeah. and uh, adapt to change. Be flexible. Anyone? I very much agree with what's being said. I think uh, taking risk is very, very important. Um, especially if you want to learn new things, you need to take risks as well. That's the only way to do it. So just try it and see what happens. Good. Um, so create, I mean, one of the things that c computers and software and algorithms and AI haven't, hasn't quite cracked yet is creativity. And um, uh, that doesn't mean to say, by the way, that you should all become artists, although you should, obviously, because apparently um, you have a perfect society in which everyone can become an artist, and uh, and that's about it. You'll get you'll you'll get paid unemployment wages, and just you can paint to your heart's content. Um, I'm joking, um, but creativity is super important. Um, Steve Jobs liked to, liked to use this phrase, which I think he actually stole from someone else, which was, um, <laughs> don't skate to where the puck is, skate to where the puck is going to be. Um, in, sorry? Thank you. I need to, thank you. Wikipedia, thank you. Um, Wikipedia over here, everyone. Um, but, um, but the issue is, but I think that's, that's a very good point, yes. Where, you know, you can see where the puck is going to be. Now the thing about computers and software and algorithms is that what they're built to do is to do pattern recognition. So if you give it a bunch of data, it goes, uh, okay, that looks, I think that's a human face. Uh, yeah, it looks like a bunch of other things that I've been shown. I've been shown before, um, that I've been told are human faces. Yep, it's a human face. Right, pattern recognition. Um, but if you, but you show it the face of a cat, it goes, he's got an eyes, he's got a nose, I'm, okay, okay, I'm confused now. And, um, and that's what we're good at, obviously, is, is doing things that computers can't do. Um, and also following, doing things which are not based on pattern recognition. And, and therefore, it's not just about skating to where the puck is going to be, where you can see things heading in the future, it's where the puck is never going to fucking be in the first place. You know, you've just got to go a bit nuts and be a human. And humanity, really, is... Humanity will save us, effectively, because it can't do any of the things. It doesn't have a soul. It can't, you know, delight on music or read poetry or 
throw itself off a cliff for a girl. It can't do any of those things. Where am I going with this? Um, but, <laughs> but it can't do any of these things. So why not just, and it, you know, you've got to just go nuts a bit, a bit nuts. And because the AI ain't gonna go nuts. Okay. So there you go. Creativity, train your creativity ability then. Take risks and be flexible and learn every day. Something new. Conclusion? Go nuts. Go nuts. Okay. <laughs>